Never do business with your friends. Never build a startup without a technical founder. Never go to market without a minimum viable product. Never go to a VC without a well thought out pitch deck. And never ever hire people from Craigslist. From breaking all these rules and more, my next guest, serial entrepreneur and now investor Jack Smith, somehow turned a terrible idea into a 780 million exit. Originally from England, Jack moved to San Francisco in 2011 as part of an audacious LinkedIn hack to enter the incubator angel pad. Jack co-founded mobile ad startup Bungle, a Google Ventures-funded startup with millions of revenue, which was eventually acquired for 780 million by Blackstone. Post Bungle, Jack started advising startups like Sorios, RCI, and Onfleet. Many of these worth over 100 million with exits to back, all before the age of 30. Today we unpack scaling a startup, the hard lessons along the way from co-founder breakups to investor scandals, the good, bad, and ugly. You don't want to miss. Welcome to Villain Dollar Moves, the show for the top U.S. and Asia founders, funders, and execs. From the growing pains of a unicorn journey to IPO, scaling a venture capital firm, and the shift of wealth, we cover it all. Jack, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Looks like you did a lot of research in the、uh, intro clip. There was stuff I hadn't remembered.、There. So I really, really enjoyed actually doing the research. So thanks for、uh, the interesting, fascinating、uh, journey that that is、uh, your life. And today I'm excited to really unpack that、um, to where you are. So let's begin from the very beginning, Jack,、uh, for the benefit of our. Uh, listeners who are tuning in here from across the globe, you know, really excited to hear、uh, at the end of the day the billion dollar moves that you've taken personally. And and I know,、uh, you know, we we joke about how you started、uh, from a dingy office、uh, where you could fit like two to three people, but、uh, really your entrepreneurship、um, gene, I I want to call it or, or spirit, started a long time ago. Tell us where it began and、uh, how you got into technology, really. Yeah, starting.、Um, well, I started to try and focus on making my own money、um, when I was like thirteen,、um, just because otherwise I just had been getting an allowance from my parents, and they were telling me to do chores and stuff. And I was like, I'd rather just be independent, like financially、mm-hmm. independent. And at thirteen, any money you make is is good money, right? So even if I was working for like fifty cents an hour, at least that was money I was making myself. Like I didn't. Want to just be given money, and then、um, I had started a business, and actually it was doing、um, reasonably well, like、uh, maybe like twenty thousand dollars a year in revenue or something. And I was weighing up n- actually whether I should go to university or not. And my parents,、um, which I think was good advice, they just said,、um, "Hey, look, if you don't go to university at all, then you'll never know what it's like. But、mm. why don't you just go? And then if you don't like it, you can just drop out." But at least you've seen what it's like. Like you're not、right. really going to get the same experience if you go to university at age thirty or something for the first time.、Mm. And so then joined、um, university, and then up until that point, I'd felt quite isolated as an entrepreneur.、Um, I kind of saw these people in、um, Silicon Valley, like Mark Zuckerberg and stuff, and then felt that like Stanford and all these places have more of a community around entrepreneurship, and I didn't really feel that as much in London. So I felt kind of quite isolated.、Um, mm. But then one bit that did change me was,、um, and where I met you was that、um, this King's College London. At this business club, so I emailed my <laughs> university and I was like, "Hey, I'm doing a startup. Is there any resources to help people that want to do startups here? You know, like、um, free office space or Stanford has its own like VC fund. Like, do you right? I mean, this stuff. And then they were just like,、um, only if you're doing a medical business or something.、Mm. But then they were like, however, there is this guy that we think could be interesting for you to speak with、um, called Zane, and then he started this business club." And so I met Zane, and then it was one of the first times sitting down to chat with him that I'd met someone who was very aligned with me in terms of his goals and aspirations, and what was driving him about wanting to just do a business. And then joining the business club, then、mm. 
kind of met other people that were also passionate about entrepreneurship and business. And it was nice having um, some other people to not feel totally um, isolated a bit. You talked about your business just now, uh, you know, starting through high school, trying to uh, get, get more than an allowance uh, to, to get some freedom from, from your parents there. And that was Media Roots. Uh, and yeah. that evolved eventually into Vungle, which yeah. you then worked with Zane about. So, so tell us a little bit about how did that transition happen? Yes. Yeah, so the business that I'd started before called Media Roots was doing educational video content. So how to use um apps that are on your computer. So how to use Photoshop, how to use Microsoft Excel and things like this. And then um, at some point, actually, uh, I, I, from what I can remember, I actually was just reading like Gartner reports mm. and see, and so this was in um, 2010 and um, the iPhone app store, people don't remember, but actually the iPhone came out and it didn't have an app store. It didn't have any, any apps. It was just yeah. a phone, your music and the internet. And then about one, I believe like maybe 18 months, two years after the iPhone first launched, they launched this app store. And so me in 2010, I think that that was maybe, I think like a year after the um, app store was launched or so. And um, I read this Gartner report that mobile apps is already a huge industry, but we yeah. think it's just going to blow up and be a massive, massive industry. And so I was like, hey, that's kind of interesting this new, entirely new ecosystem. And I can see, it just seemed interesting, mobile apps. And so we just started experimenting like, hey, we've, we've got this company where we're doing videos for desktop applications. However, that's a very competitive market. No one's really mm. doing that for phone applications and games and stuff though. So um, it experimented around, again, this was early in the iPhone times. So actually our first kind of hack was um, had to like jailbreak an iPhone and piece together all this kind oh of equipment. Um, yeah. It was kind of a wacky idea. Zane was just like, hey, look, we're just going to give this idea like 48 hours. You've got like 48 <laughs> hours to do this, like because it was right. nothing to do with our normal business. So he's like, all right, look, mm. you, you can have 48 hours to experiment if nothing happens, then you've just got to drop it because this is kind of a crazy idea. Um, and then, so basically we got an intern and his first day, we sent him to go to the Apple store and we just bought a load of equipment because it's right. the Apple store, you're allowed to return anything within like 30 days. So we just mm -hmm. bought like iPads and all this equipment and then just tested around and actually got this first breakthrough where we managed to be able to record the screen of the iPhone. Now, now that's not right. a big deal. Obviously, you can just record it yeah. in the software. At the time, it was not possible to record iPhone videos. And then so we had this. And then we had then kind of pivoted Media Roots to this business idea. But the exact idea we had was mm -hmm. very terrible and would never have worked. It was basically right. an app store where every app would have a video instead of a mm. screenshot. Okay. Um, however, that put us in the right market at least the mobile app market was the right market to be in. And when right. we subsequently joined this incubator school for startups um, called AngelPad, they mm. helped us transition the idea into an actually viable idea. Okay. So, so back up a little bit. So, uh, so what you did there was first of all, wanted to convert a version of a, a mobile tutorial, but back then, I mean, I, I really, think a lot of us forget how much the iPhone and just technology has advanced. But to your point, right, it's screen recording, uh, which is something that we use almost every other day now, many of us, but it's something that, uh, you know, wasn't wasn't the norm then. So you essentially had a couple of cables and hacked it in a way that you were able to use sort of the deep back in the day DVD camcorder type uh, yeah, exactly. technology yeah. to record. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And then how did you then from that was I want to say 2011? Was that right? Yeah. Um, and then yeah. you decided so, to go to San Francisco. Yeah. So that was like the end of 2010, very mm -hmm. start of 2011. Had not really thought about San Francisco. I actually didn't really know about Silicon Valley that much, to be mm. totally honest. I don't really right. know anything. I mean, I read TechCrunch and stuff, but I didn't really know about the whole ecosystem. Um, mm. Was just reading TechCrunch one day. So at this point, this was kind of um, maybe five or six months into um pivoting to Vungle and was reading TechCrunch and saw this article that, hey, there's this incubator in San Francisco and they're giving every company that joins a um, hundred or $120,000. And then there's one spot left for somebody reading this article. And then um, 
we, I know we've got limited time, but like basically that then we were like, oh, wow, that's a cool opportunity because actually right. when we saw that, we'd got accepted to another incubator at that time. We, we were basically mm-hmm. just applying to everything, trying to get everything. Uh, we applied to that one in Europe. I can't remember. There's someone in Europe. They rejected us. And then, but the, uh, the only one we got accepted to was in Newcastle. Hmm. And then they weren't going to give us any money or anything. I think it was maybe $10,000 or something. But then right. we were kind of like, this Angel Pub one seems so much better because we're like, they're giving $120,000. It's in right. Silicon Valley. And then contrasting, I've been to Newcastle once and then it was just raining the entire time. And we're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> company, maybe, maybe it wasn't even Newcastle. It might be like Stoke or something. Yeah. And we're like, what billion dollar company? Totally. Your- so, so Silicon Valley was the choice. Uh, and I think yeah. you definitely made the right choice there. But back up a little bit. So you went to Angel Pad, uh, which is for listeners tuning in, as they quote, somewhat the equivalent they might you know pish pash me a little bit but you know yc type um incubator right but you didn't actually have a great idea and you looked around you and it seemed like everyone else had a better idea what what, what then transition what happened uh but you ended up raising the most money among the cohort right how did this all come to be um so actually i think our biggest learning from the incubator at least mine um I've subsequently read a book and then this is my most recommended book. It's called Mm. the mom test, M O M test. And it kind of codifies what I think my biggest takeaway was. And so when we went to this incubator, it's 12 weeks long. And so we had this pressure that, okay, we need to come up with an idea and find a co-founder and stuff. And uh, one of, they basically set you exercises each week. Um, Mm. Each week you go around the room and say, what progress did you make? And one week the exercise was, hey, I want you to go and speak to like 20 of your prospective customers. Mm -hmm. So for us, that was app developers. Um, And the guy said, but don't try and pitch them on your idea. Like don't try and sell them your idea or or convince them of anything. Just have a conversation and just ask them, okay, you're an app developer. What are your biggest challenges in being an app developer? And um, what we heard from that was, hey, we are experienced at making, we're we're engineers, we know how to build an app, but we don't know how to get anyone to download our app. We don't don't know how to get users. And so Mm -hmm. then we had, all right, that is a concrete problem in our market. And then basically, because we had this limited time, we basically tried out, I I would think at least six different business ideas, um, kind of one per day, actually, Um, we would make like a fake landing page website, um, making it seem like our idea already existed. And then we kind of tried to sell it to people. So um, there was this app developer conference, where we actually again, just like random hustling hacks, we managed to get a a booth at this conference um, for free. And the the other people at the conference were like Salesforce and PayPal and stuff. So these really big places, we got zero sales. Like people Mm. were just telling us this great idea because no one's going to tell you your idea is shit. Like they're just like, oh yeah, it's a great idea, but no one actually wanted it. And then one day we got this kind of spark of inspiration that we were going into a meeting with um, the guy at AngelPad. And then right. um, we had just downloaded an app on our phone um, about um, how to record a sound recorder. And so we were like, hey, is it okay if we just record the meeting to take notes or whatever? And so open the app to start recording. And I started to blaring out some advertisement for Pepsi or something like on autoplay mm. full volume. And we were like, well, one, that's really annoying. But two, um, what if instead of advertising Pepsi, like what if that video was just promoting another game or another app? And then we took that idea and and took it to the app developers. And then we tried six ideas. We knew this was the right idea because when we told people this idea, they were like, okay, I want to be your first customer. Like as soon as soon as this is ready, you have to tell me, put me down for like $5,000 or $10,000, like we want to be first in line to spend money on this. And so people were like literally throwing money at us. And so that was when we knew that, okay, this is the idea then. What was next? How did you then bridge the gap and then get to the 120K? And, uh, you know, we want to jump right in into then uh, Vungle into the next few, few stories as well. The demo day gave massive amounts of pressure. So basically we were like, okay, um, if we don't raise funding, um, by this demo date, we're going to have to go back to England 
and look like idiots because we told anyone in England, like, hey, you never believed in us. We just got into, we're moving to America now. Like right. we basically thought we'd made it just by getting in. And then we arrived and we we're like, oh, actually we haven't made it yet. Like there's a lot of work still to do. And, and then we, we also realized that we probably need to get some funding before demo day. And so right. basically the first step that we did is I kind of researched on LinkedIn and found this other guy kind of who had founded a company in our space, like mobile advertising space and already sold it. And so I just mm. reached out to him for advice. I was like, hey, you've done something similar. would love to just see what you think about what we're doing. And it just turned to that his office was around the corner from us. Like that was the benefit of Silicon Valley at the time. Now stuff is more spread out, but they're like, somebody would literally be, oh, I I'm next door to you. And so you would run right. into all these so, amazing So this people. was Linden. Linden, yes, right? Lee Linden. Yeah. Lee Linden, who's now a uh, like very successful investor. I think I did actually go, just go to their office and get them to physically sign it so that when we then pitched at Demo Day, we were able to say like, hey, we've got these like really experienced investors and we've got this mm. traction. And then this is our CTO who's like um, from Intuit and stuff. So we kind of ticked off the stuff we felt we needed to by that demo day. And that created this um, time pressure and urgency. Fantastic. So you did this, what, in, I want to think, uh, you know, demo day in, in just a time frame, what, 12 weeks or something like that? Yeah, 12 weeks, yeah. In, to get uh, everything okay. together, which is yeah. extremely intense. Uh, yeah. But then you have this check, uh, you're ready to go. You've got a CTO that's, uh, you know, going to help you get to the next stage. Because the other fact that I also want to talk about is the fact that both you and Zane are actually non-technical founders. Um, yeah, I mean, I did so actually... That yeah, it was important. I mean, I went to university for computer science, but I didn't like how it was taught. And, and so right. after like two weeks, I switched course. So uh, I kind of would just describe myself as like a crappy engineer. Like <laughs> on, if you, if you, if I meet someone who's not technical, they could be like, oh, he's sure. technical. If I meet an engineer, they would be like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, so you're, you're technical, but not technical enough. But yeah. still, you know, in, in I guess in the classic terms, uh, non-technical founder, yeah. you're not the one that's, you might yeah. be the guy who's leading product and, and marketing, but not necessarily the guy in engineering. Yeah, Is that a fair it. statement? Yeah. Right. So, so then now as you go into the next stage, um, tell us what happens. How did you get to from, you know, this really launching pad of, Angel pad, uh, pun intended, then going into seed and later stages and, and scaling the company to even internationally, how did that all um, happen? And, and what was your role in that? Well, well, one bit, it was actually the company was international from day one because we mm. were in London and then have moved to America. We kept the small office in London with three um, people, like two interns and one um, person who was kind of part time. So it was kind of international from day one, actually. Um, but right. then AngelPad, you have this demo day where you're pitching to other investors. And we were initially trying to raise $500,000 because, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't know how much we we're going to raise and um and whatnot. Uh, but then going into the demo day, we managed to, we had Lee Linden, and then we also managed um, through other scrappiness to um, get Google Ventures um, to put in $100,000. And wow. so that meant that we were able to go into the demo day. But may maybe we had one or two other investors as well, but it was kind of basically Lee Linden and Google Ventures. But basically it meant we went into the demo day in a much stronger position because we could say like, mm. hey, we're raising 500,000 and we already have half of it raised um, mm. and and being led by like a top investor. Uh, Google Ventures said like, don't mention their name for some reason. Um, but we were basically like, oh, like a top tier investor is leading it. And now yeah. we're just looking to fill out the remaining 250. And then right. when you're in that position where you're not really begging for money, you're kind of just like, hey, we already have money. Power dynamic. Into, yeah, had, switched the, up the power dynamic. So at that point, then obviously everyone wanted to invest. And um, then that's kind of why the round became 2 million instead of just 500,000. And um, once we raised the 2 million, because it was more than we expected, um, mm. we'd initially previously planned to kind of build a small product and try and make revenue very fast, but uh, perhaps immediately after. But because we raised the bigger amount of money, we were more just like, hey, actually, let's just like pause it. Um, let's, instead of trying to make money right away, we now have a buffer. So instead, let's actually build out our bigger vision of what 
we would like our product to be and then launch it. And that took a little bit longer than we expected, but basically that took about six months. So basically we raised the money and then we were just building for six months, not really selling or anything. Today, Vungle, um, and after like the Series A, like Vungle was just rolling, like it was on autopilot to some degree, like in terms of right. had customers and it was traction and moving fast. And so it definitely has product market fit today. Like it's really solving problem. But he told me that at the time, um, no one wanted the product. Um, he hmm. would have to really do brute force sales. So um, like cold emailing and then like following up with phone calls and more phone calls. And so really at the start, um, kind of the analogy that makes sense to me now, as I um, discussed with him learning about the early days was that at the start, we kind of had to be pushing a boulder up a cliff. Yikes, and then yeah. at some point it reached the top of the cliff and was able to just roll down by itself with momentum. So, you know, this an analogy of, of pushing a boulder up a hill, um, what kept you going at that time? And how would you, I mean, you know, we're founders tuning in here. How do you know you're on the right path? Like you're pushing it the right way. And at some point it is a tipping point. What was that for you? Um, I'm not sure, but I think that we had, you know, we'd thought, we tried out different business ideas and seen the promise of this business idea in order to decide to pursue it. And so we, mm. that was our indication of product market fit. And then, so once we'd raised the money, I think that we just felt we had to go all in on this idea and, and make it work. And I think that we would have basically had to have got to a point where we weren't seeing any signs of progress and basically almost ran out of money for us to have considered like trying to change that because otherwise um, we didn't necessarily have any other ideas. And we felt that this idea, we felt it was a good idea after proving out initially the customer discussions. Um, mm -hmm. So we just felt that we, we did realize as well that Vungle's a two-sided marketplace um, and many businesses are, um, and right. you have these challenges. So if it's, uh, it doesn't matter what it is for Vungle, we needed to get people showing ads who want mm -hmm. to make money and we needed advertisers to want to spend money. And that's right. the same. Let's say you're launching a dating app. Um, obviously this is stereotyping, but you would probably want to have, be balancing women and um, men if, if it's just yeah. a So buyer and seller mainstream. essentially is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. so I think we just kind of saw that, hey, look, it's challenging getting this going a bit at the start, but this is a two-sided marketplace. And once we get um, some, um, for us, it was kind of apps to show the ads, then I think we'll be able to get advertisers because people had wanted to give us money early on anyway. It was just getting those app, um, publishers, as we call it. For Vungle, as a typical B2B business and an advertising model, um, really the only focus is revenue. Like we couldn't have made an argument that like, hey, we're doing all this other stuff and then we'll make revenue later. That wouldn't right. really have made much sense. Um, I don't think we were assessing the viability of the business from revenue metrics. We weren't like, oh, if we hit this goal, it's a good business. If we don't, it's not. We, we basically were just, yeah, we didn't really have goals like that. We were just like, hey, we just need to make this a success and just work as hard as we can to make it a success. Um, I mean, Gartner and stuff were saying about, we kind of knew that the mobile app industry was really huge. There was lots of money in it. Um, and so any money that we were making was a tiny drop in the ocean in that context. I, I think, yeah, we weren't really assessing from goal perspective. We were just like, we need to make this work. Hmm, interesting. And, you know, fast forward, you um, decide at some point that um, you wanted to leave the business. I think this was just after Series B. Was that right? Tell us um, about what a bit before what, the series B. Mm -hmm. um, a bit before so, the series B. Yeah. So what happened there and why did you leave? Um, I mean, it's hard to say like a simple one reason. I think there were different uh, reasons adding up. But we had just started the business, just me and my friend Zane. And at the start, when there's just two of you, you're kind of doing everything. Um, so for me, for example, counting doing product and marketing. For Zane, he took on a bit more of the selling um, for some degree, like investor relations and stuff like that. And then mm -hmm. as a company grows, I think you need to kind of fire yourself from those different 
responsibilities and, and scale right. yourself into a different role where you're not all about doing you're more about like um enabling and what i observed at there was that zayn just somehow naturally really scaled really really fast for him himself into mm. this role of being a ceo like a professional ceo like he just like naturally took on that and and right. the transition was very natural for him whereas for me i was kind of just still stuck in the weeds and i think mm. actually was slowing the business down a lot because i was a bottleneck that i hadn't been successful in firing myself so even if it was like a tiny i think we also had a challenge um growing our mindset from a, a scarcity mindset to a growth mindset we were used to having no money we we wouldn't yeah. spend any money but then raising 2 million you need to transition that but still even when i was there towards the end i was signing like 20 dollar checks and stuff <laughs> and that's not conducive to scaling a business so i think i was kind of slowing it down so that was one reason that i didn't scale my bit as much because i was stuck in the business mm-hmm. too much and my co-founder seemed to scale a lot better and the other bit was um quite burnout as well that i i basically had got an apartment opposite our office so it was right. literally across the street and so basically um i didn't really have any friends in san francisco either i didn't know anyone uh, i basically mm-hmm. was just in the office 7 days a week um all of the time and um i i was there till after midnight each day like much longer than everyone else left um because i just didn't really have a life outside of it yeah. and so that also does catch up on you um where if you don't have any separation that if you just only work then mm. um kind of just you you are going to burn out at some point because yeah. i just didn't have a life and i had yeah. a holiday on a thing so i think with hindsight um if i were to be giving myself in that position advice again um what i would have said is that i think that what i should have done is taken at least 2 weeks off mhm maybe one week just totally detached don't check emails or anything just read books or just totally detached go to some other country or something and right. then um on another aspect i could have met other entrepreneurs who had been in positions like me but now their business is much bigger and successful and asked them uh because i couldn't really see zane was asking me like what do you want your role to be as the company mm. scales and i couldn't right. really see what spe- I-, i was used to being more a generalist like taking on loads mm. of tasks i couldn't really see what specifically defined role would be best for me and i think that what i should have done is taken a step out of the business um like taken a step back uh take a week or two to meet other people and ask them like hey as your business scaled how do you divide up the responsibilities and stuff um but i didn't do that but i think that would have been a good idea so if you did i mean now you know hindsight's always 2020 um but what would you think your specific role ideally would have been in this business and what's your specialty now in, in, based on what you've done so far i mean um it's hard to pinpoint exactly i think even beyond just a uh, limiting skill set i i think that i also should have adjusted i needed to adjust my m- mindset from you know micromanaging every element of the business to um enabling other people more and trusting them more because otherwise i was just uh kind of trying to touch a lot of the stuff and your culture is very important and so if something was going on that i felt didn't match the kind of culture we were trying to build for the business then i yeah. was like on top of it but then you waste your time uh like i would now with hindsight see it as a waste like trying to create a cool office environment or or something like it is a balance because some of the stuff you could call it a time waste but then right. has continued in the business today like some small stuff so every person that joined the business we had a polaroid camera and took a photo right. of them and added it to a wall and that creates uh, an environment culture. where yeah culture is it's not just a job so right. vungle 
many of the people now are still like really, really good friends that were there early on. Um, the, the first 20 to 30 people, super close. Yeah. Some of them have got married. Some of them are like still dating. Um, yeah. And then they go to each other's weddings and stuff and really close. And we did cr successfully create that environment. But some of it, um, some of the initiatives could have been like too much time wasting. Like, Understood. Uh, yeah you could have focused on, on bigger stuff yeah. yeah like I was trying to hang plants upside down from the ceiling <laughs> um and oh Jack like all right that's cool but is that a good use of your time exactly. I think because I didn't have the separation between work and play as I said because mm. it was not clearly defined I was just trying to have fun in the business because you touch on two things one is friendship uh so you and Zane uh, go into business as friends and still today remain as friends. But, um, you know, it'll be remiss for me to touch upon the scandal uh, that unfortunately landed upon TechCrunch and a lot of the front pages with Zane being front and center of, of course, the allegations being cleared. Uh, but how did you, as a co-founder and as a friend, um, work through all those hard things with the board, you know, demanding different things. And uh, it felt like the easiest way was to get Zane out and you as the friend, uh, and the fact that both of you started this, how, how did you handle that time, which was, um, as I can only imagine, a very difficult one? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I just was then just trying to support um, Zane because um, I kind of also observed that if you get accused of something, even though he got acquitted of all of the stuff later, um, yeah. if you just get accused of something, then many of the people that are in your network, like not actually your friends, they're just acquaintances in your business network, they'll just mm. um, ditch you as soon as you get, if, if, if you have any negative PR, it's not worth yeah. it. You know, if, if they're not your friend, if and I think he had also mixed up that he had an, a, a very big network that he thought mm. were all his friends, but they weren't his friends. They were business acquaintances. And so they all disappeared. Right. And so I was just trying to just support him as a, a friend when um, stuff was was going on. I, I was not in the business, so I was not really involved with stuff going on there. I can imagine probably in the business that would have been like really challenging, you know, because um, if any business has a scandal, then um, that's a really tough thing to keep everybody focused and motivated and move through it like you've got lots of it's a very big distraction for everybody and um, probably very distressing for everybody as well yeah and, and now I mean um, it hopefully ended with a positive note you know those charges were cleared and you're all on to different chapters now um, but also uh, you made a handsome margin hopefully uh, with the exit to Blackstone um, how did that feel? Do you feel that um, as a co-founder from, you know, t writing those $20 checks, right? Um, and then getting it to the stage, do you feel that you've made it? Um, I did feel in some ways that I'd made as a goal. Like when we were starting the company, we didn't talk about, hey, we want to sell the company for a billion dollars or or do this. Um, basically mm. what I feel, and, and I think, that is one bit that's important with co-founders is you can have misalignment. So um, if we had been misaligned on that, maybe we got an offer to sell the company for a million dollars. Um, and if one of us had wanted to take it and one of us not, that would have created a big conflict. But I think we yeah. were always aligned that basically neither of us, I don't think, were that motivated about m trying to get rich or make money. Um, what was motivating both of us, I think, was trying to build something big. Early on, right. we were reading about Google and um, Larry and Sergey, and we just thought that it's awesome. They've built something really big and impactful. And then talking with Zane, the things that were motivating us was like going up to ring the bell to IPO. You know, we weren't yeah. like, oh, if I get a billion dollars, then I want to like buy a private jet and buy a plane. We didn't right. care about money. And I think the same would go for Zane and I that maybe we came from somewhat slightly um, similar backgrounds in terms of like not super uh, affluent and so I think mm -hmm. the main things that were cool for us um, for Zane as well was like hey I just want to get a little bit of money so that he could he just wanted to get a little bit of money so he could pay off his parents mortgage you know yeah, um, nice. and so you don't need a billion dollars to do that, you know? So yeah. we were never really that focused about becoming a billionaire or something. Like the only bits that we would talk about were 
in comparison, much smaller um, sums of money. Um, but we were always aligned to about building something big. And then the company sold for uh, a big uh, amount. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know at what point we could have maybe comprehended that number. Um, yeah. But I think that if we were still there, we would have wanted to keep building it and like IPO it. Um, we weren't ever really trying to want to sell it. Got um, it. But I think yeah. everyone happy with how stuff went. The company is still around today and doing good. And it was yeah. a big um, sale for um, everyone involved. And then is cool also catching up with early people that joined and hearing about how yeah. the money for them has impacted their life. So I think that um, on a whole, pretty much everyone should be happy. So now coming to the end of the session, um, you know, you're talking about impact now in your second chapter. And I want to also congratulate you. You're speaking to me uh, as a new father uh, Mm -hmm. to your little baby. Um, So this is the new chapter for you. Uh, What's next for Jack Smith? Um, I think that many successful entrepreneurs that I know, they have um, a chip on their shoulder. So they kind of have Mm -hmm. something to prove or, you know, like, yeah, if we're looking at like Donald Trump, like maybe he, people say that he was like living in the shadow of his dad, that his dad was very successful. And so his chip on his shoulder might be that he wants to show he's successful in his own right. And that's what's driving him. And I think many entrepreneurs have that, even if it's not as maybe obvious as the Trump case. And for me, I think it was partly about because I was starting business when I was young, like 15 or something, I always felt that people were not really like taking me that seriously or respecting me that much because, you know, I was just um, a high school kid. And so I kind of felt like, hey, I think that actually I, I am more competent than, or I felt that I wasn't getting the kind of respect that I deserved. I mean, I didn't think that I'm amazing, but I just felt that I should at least have some legitimacy. And that was kind of my chip on my shoulder. And um, what building that fungal got to the scale it did and then sold, I maybe didn't have that same um, chip in terms of driving me that, oh, I have to build a really massive business because um, I need to prove myself to somebody or whatever. And so when I just sat down and reevaluated maybe a year or so ago, Then I thought like, okay, what bit would be driving me now? And I kind of came to the conclusion that for me, it would be more um, driving for me, empowering to focus on where I could have like impact and Mm -hmm. impact in areas that perhaps other people are not seeing as a priority to focus on. And for me, that has kind of looked like a few different charitable um, nonprofit initiatives that I've um, started or help um, start. And so that has been pretty fulfilling that, you know, it's a different rush. Like there's one rush, um, checking the company's bank balance and then seeing a million dollars hit the bank balance for the first time and then counting how many digits are in that number. And then it's a totally different, um, rush now where, uh, one of the uh, charities I'm involved with is helping people that are incarcerated in prison. And, you know, then someone writes a letter in about how it's changing their life. And um, one person had said like, oh, I've been in prison for like 20 years and then I've, I, I've never seen anything like this program and I, I wish I'd seen it earlier. And so you're yeah. getting a different fulfillment um, entirely, but just as fulfilling, really. And final words for our founders. What would your advice be to founders who are deep in the rough, in the thick of things and working really hard? Um, I, I guess it's just like, that not ev- one bit is that not everybody actually maybe should be a founder. Um, it is yeah. very glorified being a founder and they're the ones that movies get made about and all this kind of thing. But um, it's also pretty awesome to be an amazing operating person, um, uh, amazing operator. And so I think people shouldn't necessarily just be driven towards entrepreneurship if that is what they're seeing glorified as being a celebrity um i Mm. think for me a lot of entrepreneurship it's really really hard so you're only doing it because that's the only thing you can see yourself doing like for me i would be a really really terrible employee like no one would want to employ 
Love it. All right. Well, Jack, you know, being in it for the right purpose, being aligned with your co-founder, so many nuggets and gems that you're dropping for us here today in Billion Dollar Moves. And I so appreciate your time. And to all of you tuning in, you know, thanks so much for, for taking the time to really dive in. I know we could have spent a lot, a lot longer and maybe we'll do that later on. But um, let's now jump into the second. 